that you've given us at the moment of salvation, instantaneously, all things became new. But help us understand that all things, Father, that what all things really means. Help us to see that there are some things that change slowly and that we need to be fully active in participating in your plan and to, for that to occur, and that it doesn't end. There's no, there's no ending to it in this life, only in the next. And so I pray that you give us clarity and understanding today. In Christ's name, amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Romans 6.6 6 will be two passages we'll look at today to try to put together to form a concept that I believe is very important to if you're going to live the Christian life uh, into maturity. I was telling Gary at the half, my preoccupation as a Christian, as a teacher, as a thinker is living the Christian life into the, into the deeper, onward to the deeper things of God. I remember uh, on, my, on my, oh, uh, the paper where I was, uh, what do you call it when you get certified? Ordained. I was ordained. If that's any indication of where my message is going today, I'll be stuttering a lot when I... Uh, but, uh, you know, one of my friends on there put onward to the deeper things of God. And that's been my thought. And this is, this is a study for that. But at the moment of salvation, when we trust in Christ, the Bible teaches that all things become new. And, and that's this. If any man is in Christ, literally it doesn't say he is a new creature. You've got to love Paul when he gets excited. He leaves out pronouns and connecting verb, I mean, connecting particle. He just leaves everything out. He says, new creature, new creature. He says, the whole things have passed away and behold, it do. He says, behold. I mean, you, you got to watch this. Somebody's, somebody's writing this down for him and he is walking around the room preaching. That's what's happening here. Now, what he needed was a computer with one of those dictating programs. And But he, look, the Lord provided, way back in the first century, a computer with a dictating program. It was called Luke. Uh, yeah, you know, I ought to come up with a dictating program and call it Luke. At the moment we trust, and God changes a lot of things, and these are the 50 things. This is our study in the 50 things. Paul, in this passage, is, is discussing... Uh, the positional aspects of the Christian life. When he says all things, he's talking about all things positional. And the aspects of the Christian life that deal with our capacity and ability to understand spiritual things. Our position in Christ and all that comes with it and, and the spiritual capacities that come from the Holy Spirit enabling us to understand because we, we don't have that as an unbeliever. You don't have the capacity to understand spiritual things until you're a believer in Christ with the Holy Spirit. Before that, you're only, you're only able to understand human phenomena in that to a point. And, and listen, in that realm, you're, you're limited by your own intelligence. You know, you take somebody like Stephen Hawking, in the human realm, and he's supposedly this great genius guy. But in the spiritual realm, with the Holy Spirit, listen, we're all great genius guys. He gives you great ability to see things beyond the human realm. E listen, into eternity... Stephen Hawkins can't see into eternity. Listen, this guy can only see into the past a certain point where he says everything started with a big rock. And when you ask him where the big rock came from, he calls you foolish. Well, who's foolish? When I can see into eternity and this guy can't even see the past? Well, that's supposed to be funny, but y'all missed it. Oh. 
Thanks for the laugh there. Oh. Now, what does not, listen, what does not instantaneously become new is the content of your ideas and beliefs. And this is something that's really misunderstood, in my opinion, by many believers. Many of us have believed, and I believe for years, that when I got saved, all of the influence that had been in my life from the old sin nature and the world had been wiped out. And that I was choosing between the spirit and my sin life on level ground. And I'll explain that as we go. But the first stages of the Christian life deal primarily with understanding who we are in Christ. That's, where, that's what it's all about. As a baby believer, up into functional early adulthood, let's say from, from baby believer until maybe 18 years old. You know, at 17, 18 years old, you can be technically, technically be called an adult, but not a mature adult. Okay? So that's the same idea in spiritual life is that you start as a baby, and by the time you get to this level of adulthood, you're functional and you can live, but you're far from mature. After we learn, well, we learn about our position in Christ, eternal security. That's really important as a young believer. All of the assets imputed to spiritual royalty, the basics of how to function, these are all first things that we learn. How to function as a priest and relate to God. You see, your priesthood is how you relate to God. And then you have your ambassadorship is how you relate to others. And listen, the flow, there's a flow. The flow is this way, down into you and out to others. It's never out to others to appeal to God. It's appeal to God and God, open to God and let God pour through you Grace to others, always that way. Very important. Now, the latter stages of growth are centered on, the, on mature living based on intimacy with God. This is where the purification of the soul and even the most subtle of ideas and falsehoods in the heart are to be addressed and, and confronted. This is where, I'm going to give you an analogy, a couple of them. This is where you've gotten your armor. You know, you've signed up for military service. You've been going through basic training. You've been issued your armor. You've been taught how to fight with your sword and use your shield and put on everything and you're ready and you stand at attention and you think you're ready to go. And... The next assignment is you're taken into the, into the washroom and taken up to the mirror, and he says, take off your helmet. Look in the mirror. The next assignment is you. We're not going to talk about how to swing your sword. We're going to talk about your character. And he begins a whole process of dealing with your character, of your honesty, of your of your, I mean, really, do you believe? If you really believe, why are you subtly or only partially obedient? Saul, why aren't you completely obedient? And then you, you tell God, you, you, say to, you say to Samuel, I've obeyed the Lord, and yet only in form, only in appearance. You've, you have the appearance. And, we, hey, we're all convinced. I'm talking to me now. But deep down, deep down, you're still struggling with the same issues, same addictions, same pleasure pursuits that you always were, and you've not really addressed it and let that, given that to the Lord. You really haven't crossed that barrier of, of the self. And that's what I want to share with you today. 
Another analogy I love is the nation Israel. It was born through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as we're born into the spiritual life. The foundation of the, of the spiritual Israel was formed through Joseph, was hardened, developed through their time in slavery. Then they were ready. They were ready. They were oriented to walking with God daily by their privation and adversity in the desert. This is the initial phase. God gave them the Mosaic law. He gave them knowledge and understanding. And then he brought them to the promised land. This is like bringing you to yourself and going, all right, now you've got to cross. You've got to cross the river and take the land. Now, did they do that? In my life, God brought me some time back to a point where he said, I want you to look at all of the character issues in your life. And to me, that became the land. My own heart, belonging to God, became the land of milk and honey. And he said, I want you to go in and free your own heart from the enemies you've allowed in it. You've allowed the enemies of God to enter your heart and set up shop and form a whole civil, a whole lifestyle. And they live there even today. He said, I want you to go in and, and I want you to cleanse that. I want you to cleanse all of them as Israel was supposed to cleanse the land. First thing they had to do was cross the river. You know, there was a, it was a pretty, pretty swift stream right there where you wanted them to cross. Do you know the second generation exactly, you know what happened to that swift stream when they put their foot in the water? As soon as the first man dipped his toe, the water stopped. And they crossed and they took the land, part of the land. What happened with those particular enemies in the land that they refused to cleanse, remove, with whom they made treaties. We talked about this on Sunday night. By the way, on Sunday night, we have a Bible class, but none of you are invited. <laughs> none of you are invited. So it's a little bit reverse psychology there. Uh, we talk about on Sunday night, you know, how... Uh, you, you got to take the land. Anyway, let's move on. But this is the analogy I, I use in my own life. And all of these, these, these false ideas and these false idols and these ideas of what happiness would be if only I could have so-and-so. You know, if only my children and if only my wife, if only our finances, if only my health, if only only. I would be happy, finally, finally, be happy. But we have positional assets that are given instantaneously at the, at the moment of salvation, and they're permanent. You understand that, right? Everybody understand that? This is positional truth. These are the 50 things. This is who you are in Christ. And I'll say a little more about that. Then we have practical capacities which have to do with your ability to understand through the ministry of the Spirit, the ability to walk in the Spirit, to hear the Spirit's voice, to feel and sense His leading. These are, this, and this is also given, the, the setup is given at salvation, but the ability, you know, Hebrews 5.14 talks about your faculties, are developed through use. And this ministry of the Spirit and understanding not only the Word itself, but how to walk the Word in your daily life, this develops. It develops through, through daily use. And finally, practical content, which is the... Con Listen, here's the, here's the setup. Here's the mechanism, if you will, Here's your body indwelt by the Spirit. 
Here's your mind, which is the, here's your human spirit to whom the spirit speaks. Here's your mind that understands. Here's your heart that believes and stores and lives. That's your mechanisms. But the content means is everything. It's everything. It's not do you believe, it's what do you believe. It's what you believe. See, people, these Muslims that are so celebrated today, they believe intensely. They just believe something that's going to be very bad for them in, in, in eternity and bad for us now. They believe the wrong thing. Do you think that as a believer that you're capable of believing the wrong thing? Say yes, of course. Now, positional assets, the 50 things. Uh, you can read this. I don't have time. I want to get to my third, fourth point. All things become new. You get a new identity. Hey, I was sitting right back there. I don't know how many years ago, long before I was married, and a uh, long, long time ago, and I don't know, I've been here, I don't know, 10 years maybe. I don't know how long it was, but the study that night was going to be, and we used to have the overhead and everything, and I came in, and Ron had written Positional Truth. And, of course, I was a fancy-dancy, mature preacher boy, and I had studied Positional Truth on my own, so many times, and I was like, oh, no. <sighs> what do you do? You know, there's a good show on TV. It's not started yet. I better slip, slip out of here. And I said, no, I'm going to stay. The bell rang, and I, it is my job. I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be. It was that night, hearing positional truth for the umpteenth time, that I finally understood that that's who I was in Christ. A bell went off in my soul. A light came on. The eyes of my heart were enlightened. And I went, wow. And it was a major leap in my spiritual life. Listen, because I was faithful to be where I was supposed to be on a night to hear something I'd heard a million times before. Oh, identity, legality, status, all these principles now when it comes to our practical capacities to live the Christian life, regeneration takes care of that. We're made alive. We're given the capacity to understand spiritual things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it tells us that the natural man, the man without the Holy Spirit, cannot understand spiritual phenomena. It is foolishness to him. So as an unbeliever, Without the Holy Spirit, and you hear spirit, you hear the gospel or spiritual things, you're like, that makes no sense to me. That sounds ridiculous. And it does. <laughs> Hebrews 5.14 says these human faculties, which are the mind, you listen, your human faculties are your mind and your heart, your spirit. The means of using these faculties is found through the eyes of your heart, and inner dialogue, listen, we've been talking inner dialogue for a year around here. If you don't understand it, if you don't understand the eyes of your heart or inner dialogue, listen, you can't really apply the Word of God. You don't know how to apply it. Now, that may sound, that may, uh, does that make you mad? I hope not. But I, I hope it challenges you. But he talks about exercising your faculties by hearing, understanding, and using them under the ministry of the Spirit. Now let's talk about practical content because that's where the rubber meets the road. Our old, now if you turn to Romans 6.6, 6, they're real important. Romans 6, chapter 6, verse 6. I don't know how many times I read that passage without ever really exegeting it until I never understood what it was saying. Never paid attention to it. In chapter 6, starting with verse 1 through verse 5, he's talking about 
how the fact that we have been justified and we've been buried with him, we've been, we've been crucified with him and we've been buried with him and we've been raised with him to walk in newness of life. And the issue here is the walking in the newness of life, okay? He's, that's what he's after in chapter 6. In chapter 6 is where he talks about being a slave to sin. It, the, he who gives himself over to sin, it becomes his master. And it becomes the master and you become the slave. You with me? What you give yourself over to again and again and again, it's called habituation. It's called forming a pattern and a habit. Becomes your master. Now, in Romans chapter 6, he says, Now, knowing this, you've got to understand this, that your old man, your old self, was crucified with Christ. Now, this is positional. This has to do with the fact that it's called retroactive positional truth, where we were on the cross with him, we were in the grave with him. We were in the resurrection with him. And now we're walking newness of life with him. But, but we can't, listen, we can't walk newness of life unless we know how to do this. So he says, the old self was crucified positionally so that, and he's going to give you a hena plus the subjunctive. And he now plus the subjunctive sets up a future possibility. Future possibility. You have been freed positionally from the sin nature and your slavery to the sin nature. And not only the sin nature, but the ideas that you formed in your previous unbelieving life that came from the sin nature. You've been freed positionally from them but not practically. That's why we keep going back and eating up the vomit. Beautiful image, isn't it? He says, so that, he not so that, in order that the body of sin, now you're going to say, well, what's the body of sin? Turn with me over to chapter 7, just one page, chapter 7, verse uh, oh yeah, two pages. Chapter 7, verse 24. He calls it the body of sin. And over here in verse 7, verse 24, he called, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Sin and death. This body of sin and death that he's describing in chapter 6 and 7, he's described in chapter 7 as that which causes him to want to do God's will and yet not and want to not do sin, and yet he does it. You remember the discussion in chapter 7? Where he says, the things that I want to do, I, can't, I find I can't do. And the things that I don't want to do ever again, I do all the time. Is that not the Christian's life before you reach a stability point? You say, what, what stability point? What stability point? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you hear that? You mean there's actually a point in my life I can reach where I'm not going back and forth? Where I'm not always going back and forth? Absolutely. And if you don't know that yet, I got a, I, I got a little pri present for you with a little bow on it. Most wonderful thing. I'm going to give it to you in chapter 6, verse 6. He says, so that might be destroyed this body of death, and this is an heiress, passes subjunctive. In other words, what you were given at the point of salvation through this positional freedom from the old way set up the personal capacity to change the practical content of your heart, to free you from all the old ways that still dominate your life, to free you from it so that you can walk freely in Christ without this dragging you back down. Now, hang with me just a second more. 
knowing this, that our old man, our old way of thinking, our old life was crucified with Christ for this purpose, that we might be able to destroy it in our future walk with Christ as we walk in newness of life, that we may be able to destroy this and walk freely in the Spirit. Our old ideas and beliefs are not removed from us at the point of salvation. Do you know that? That when you're saved, one of the things that God does not give you is a new new mind. He doesn't give you a new cardia. You take the old one into the Christian life with you. Plus, inside of that cardia are all the ideas that you've ever believed and stored that are part of what you call we call your belief system. Things that are true and things that are not true. Right, wrong, good, bad, you carry all of that into the Christian life with you. Do you see that? Or, do, or have you believed that, you, that all that's wiped out at the moment of salvation? Where, where do you stand on that? I know where I stand. I mean, I used to stand on the fact that it was all wiped away. And then I realized, hmm, if it was all wiped away, why do I keep doing the same things I've always done? Why is it so easy to do the same things I've always done the way I've always done them before salvation and after? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because you took all those old patterns with you. And now you've got you to undo them. You've got to defeat them. So the question is, how do you do it? We bring our previously developed beliefs and ideas into the Christian life as part of the spiritual struggle. Our positional blessings and capacities have equipped us to fight and win this spiritual battle. As, just as Israel was able to go into the land and defeat the giants and the enemies and everything in there, they had the capacity through the power of God to cleanse the land so you and I have been given the capacity to cleanse through the ministry of the Spirit and the Word of God and the Christian life to cleanse our own hearts. And we are to do so and, and, and walk freely with Christ, totally devoted, totally free from this life and devoted to this one. We fight the devil and the world on the outside of ourselves, our souls, and yet we fight the old man, the sin nature, and our old beliefs on the inside. They match up. See, you were born with a sin nature, but out of that sin nature, by living in the world without God, you built a whole list of ideas and a way of jiving in your life out of the world that had nothing to do with God, and you've carried that with you into the Christian life. And now what do we do with it? The principle of habituation. Let me give you that right quick. Do you know how important habits are? Let me tell you, everything works on habit. Listen to me just a minute more. I know it's hot. I know you are think I'm crazy, but... Uh, did you know that by choosing to believe the same thing, right or wrong, over and over again, that the neurons of your brain will literally shift inside, the physical neurons will shift inside of your brain and set up pathways, physical pathways for the electrical currents and the chemical thoughts that are formed by simply choosing Again and again, pathways are set up physically. Now, that's called soul over physical, you know, psychosomatic, whatever. That's how powerful habit is. By doing it again and again and again and again, you not only form the mental habit, emotional habit, it turns into a physical habit is what slavery is built on. Paul says in Romans 6 that you can be a slave to sin or you can be a slave to what? Righteousness. You know what that is? Habit. 
habit. It's what you live over and over and over again. Now, our old habituated ideas that our beliefs that we formed when we were under the world and the sin nature are still on the inside remaining dominant in our thinking. Here's what I want you to get, and then we got to close. When you're tempted to do something that you've been tempted to do many times before, do you realize that you're not on level ground with that temptation and that the temptation that's in your soul is based on something that you have chosen many, many times and the habit of having chosen to follow the sin nature so many times by using this idea has made that one so much easier to do than to follow the Spirit. Did you follow that? Listen, when you're filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, you are free from the effect of the old man. You got that? This is so important. I'm not going to finish it. If you want to know the rest of it, you got to come tonight. But uh, you're, here you are in the Spirit. You're, you're able to resist the temptation of the sin nature and the old way of thinking, the old pattern, old habit. This old habit may be to fight with your spouse. It may be to get discouraged or depressed. It may be to look at life in a bad way. I got a praise. Did anybody remember Benji? I don't think he'd mind me saying this. Benji, Benjamin, that was uh, Gene's nephew. Guys hooked on crack, coke, whatever, you know, he was just a pitiful fella. I couldn't help him. He just was, called me yesterday. Sounds like a different man. He's been off everything for 18 months. He is, he, he, his voice is different. He's confident in the way he speaks. He's realigned the neurons of his brain. He broke that old habit. He created a new habit by walking in the Lord. He's got a new way. Here's what I want you to understand, is that when you're being tempted by something that's very familiar with you, it's not that you're free in the middle to go one way or the other, You've got an old history over here. You've got an old history over here. The only thing that enables you to break free of that is the Spirit. And as soon as you let go of the Spirit, what happens to you? Boy, you get sucked back so fast. And you're back in this old way. Here's another thing that, that, that has to be said before we close in prayer, and that is, what if you just try to focus over here and stay focused on the Spirit and just ignore that? I mean, after all, in Philippians chapter 3, didn't Paul say, forget about it? That's not what he said. He said, leave it behind, which is a totally different thing. But we can try to take the Word of God and the will of God and the Spirit of God and overwhelm all that, or listen, you can do what Paul says to do, and that's remove it from your soul. If you want to know how to do all those things, then I know where there's a Bible class tonight that talks about that. Let's close in prayer. Father, what a great privilege to be part of your family. And, and these great issues, Father, are so difficult to pull apart and to see into our own soul. I mean, it's such murky territory where we don't often look and we're simply not good at looking and nobody's ever been able to help us pull all those pieces apart. And as, as someone that's trying to do it for myself, Father, and to try to pull those pieces apart for others to see, what a challenge. It's very difficult to explain and describe. And I pray that the Spirit will just take make up for for my lack, 
for Ron's lack, for his great efforts over all these 40 years to help all of us to put it together. What a challenge. And I pray that we would hear this and sense the need that maybe we haven't heard it all. Maybe we don't know it all yet. Maybe there's something left there to discover that might make the road uh, more enjoyable and more maybe more victorious that we haven't actually seen the total victory yet. Challenge us with this, Father, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen.